to you, O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. I want to begin by uh, sharing two excerpts from Christianity Today, one from the July 4th issue and one from the July 10th issue. It is not an overstatement to say that there is a fear epidemic in America these days. Swapping stories of fright and scarcity has become our national pastime. It's always been true that if you want to kill an idea, a piece of legislation, or another person's dignity, you just get people good and scared of what the idea is, what the policy is, or who the person is. From the July 4th issue, we're going to protect Christianity, says 45. To Liberty University students while on a campus visit. This depiction of Christians as a beleaguered lot under assault from multiple threats has shaped numerous conspiracy theories and even guide a pledge to defend Christianity. Well, the problem is Christianity doesn't need to be protected. Christ Christmas doesn't need to be saved. And American Christians are not an invalid people. But the idea of protecting and defending Christianity fits a threat-based political ideology more than a life anchored in compassion and godly devotion. I recognize that fear is a tremendous unifier. It holds people together like nothing else, like no other ideology, national symbol, or cultural creed, by subscribing to every fear and threat is a strange way to live out the Christian life. But here's the thing. As Christians, we have been made into the household of God. We are members of the household of God. We embrace a theology of inclusion, of acceptance, of forgiveness, and grace. And in today's readings, they tell us a way to get past the fear, how to operate in unity, how to prepare for the journey and how to sustain our life in the midst of it all. So I stand here today after being with TFAM, their leadership conference for the last few days. And after experience, and TFAM is uh, the um, brain fart, <laughs> the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, which was a movement began by Bishop Yvette Flunder for primarily the black LGBT people in the church who had been kicked out once they came out. So I, that's where I have been for the last few days at her national leadership conference because TFAM is now a part of the United Church of Christ. Because TFAM is planting and uh, uh, starting having more new, new church starts than any other segment of the United Church of Christ. And those new church starts are not just in this country, but in Uganda, but in Nigeria, in Canada. So this one woman with this idea of radical inclusion is changing not just the face of Christianity, but the face of our own denomination. So after being with them for the last four days, after experiencing the radical inclusion of Christ, after being in Pentecostal praise with a liberation theology, with people like Bishop Yvette Flunder and the Reverend uh, Dr. Otis Moss, uh, the Reverend Dr. William Barber of the Revitalized and Repurposed 
Poor People's Campaign, after being with our own Tracy Blackman, who is our National Minister of Witness and Justice, and our own General Minister and President John Dorhauer, all these people were at this conference to stand in solidarity. So I come back to this community after being both challenged by the Holy Spirit and if you've ever known anything about TFAM, filled with the Holy Ghost. I know we don't say that in the UCC, but that, I just came back. <laughs> <laughs> My heart has been opened even wider to the challenges of the gospel and the political origins of this spiritual quest. I was in a place where people have been seeking refuge and a leader to lead them out of places of narrow theological judgment and social stigma. I was in a place where people gathered from near and far just to touch and to be touched by those articulating a vision of what a world would look like that really had room for everyone and really took care of the least of us and really was filled with compassionate power. Our reading from Ephesians makes the point that God's reconciliation and transformation of humanity finds expression in unity marked by welcoming and hospitality. Let us consider the areas of divisiveness in the church or even within our culture. We in the church should not presume that those that we call outsiders need to become like us. Our church should be a light that paves the way by welcoming, as it says in the text, both Jew and Gentile, both believer and unbeliever, both straight and gay, even those of other faiths. So over the past few days, I witnessed the true reconciliation that is possible through the sacrifice of Christ. Behind that statement, behind the sacrifice of Christ, is the upside down idea that such uniting of humanity was not won through the blood of conquest and victory, but through love and empowerment. In the New Testament, the way the church exists as a church, as one body and one spirit with one baptism, matters deeply because it is how peace comes into broken humanity. Not through coercion, not through laws, not through war, but through grace and reconciliation. Now, many have understood that idea that the church needs to go out and convert every individual in the world to be a Christian so that peace can reign. Well, I think that's a mistaken notion. What the church is called to do is to be the reconciled community of every race, every tribe, every nation, every sex, every class, and every language. The church doesn't force us to all be the same. It exists as a peaceful diversity in the world. And the world is changed by it. Such was the theme for the conference I attended by TFAM. I was there as people gathered of every race, every class, and sexual orientation and gender expression. I witnessed the empowerment, I felt the energy, I saw their spiritual hungers being fed while their intellect and their imaginations were stirred. So when I read today the scripture from Mark, I understand the longing for the crowd for a compassionate, empowering, healing word. I understand how awful it must have been for the ancients to be living on the margins of military empire and each day bringing a new outrage, a new heartbreak. People 
both fragile and afraid. Because still today, it is still so awful for those living on the margins, having their children treated as pawns of the empire, torn from their mother's arms. Because this day, every time I turn on any news source, it brings new outrage, a new heartbreak. And people looking for a better life, looking for a way out, looking for a chance, looking just to worship their God and celebrate their culture are vulnerable, fragile, and afraid. It's a strange time we live in as Reverend Will William Barber put it, you can buy unleaded gas for your car, but you can't provide unleaded water. Children. Mark opens informing us that Jesus and his faithful band are tired and burnt out and need to retreat to get away if just for a moment. So this is a word to those who are forevering, endeavoring to live lives of purpose and service, that even Jesus became physically and emotionally drained. I'm not going to call their names, but it's two people's names that begin with J, but I'm going to say that again. Even <laughs> Jesus became physically and emotionally drained. Even Jesus, who wants to be in right relationship with our neighbor, became overwhelmed by the constant pull of relational living. And even Jesus needs a moment to mourn his friend, his beloved colleague, for John the Baptist has just been murdered. And so he and his band retreat so they might return to their work, able to be attentive, able to be compassionate and loving. Now, I don't know about you, but I know about me. I know how short I can be when I haven't had the time to reset my clock. I know how impatient I can be when I am tired and everything seems to be very overwhelming. When I don't have a moment to be still and reflect. So as we begin our story with Jesus showing us the way to stay on top of our calling, whatever it may be, it's like they tell you on the airplane, when turbulence comes, put the oxygen mask on yourself first. And then after you can breathe, after you can stabilize yourself, then you are able to assist those around you who are vulnerable. It's a message to us in our personal and professional lives, although the, the demands of our lives will continue, we all need a moment to stop and rest. Perhaps that's why the Sabbath, the idea that we are taking to take a day set aside to rest and honor God is not a suggestion, but a command. And now Jesus is again in the midst of the multitudes needing something, wanting something from him. Now to understand this whole idea of him shepherding and feeding the text, you have to go to the Old Testament, to Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. The God of Israel says to the shepherds who tend my people, because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care upon them, woe unto you. But I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, says God. And then in Ezekiel, in which God stands against the abusive shepherd, who no longer care for their sheep. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, Woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of their flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool and the slaughter of the choice of the choices of the animals. 
but you do not take care of your flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. For power and authority are one side of the coin of what a king is to do, but the other side of that coin is the king's responsibility to its citizens, to make sure that there are justice in the courts, to make sure that the people are safe. He's the one to oversee the welfare of his people. That's why the Old Testament prophets talk about these irresponsible leaders, those self-serving leaders, those narcissistic leaders, those insecure leaders who have failed to be good shepherds of Israel, who have failed to produce justice and righteousness for God's people. So we know why the crowds are following Jesus, looking for a way to be made whole, looking for a way out of this mess. For like them, we too live on the margins of a military empire, being told time and time again, we have no money for public education. We have no money for public health. We have no money to save the environment. While we spend millions, no trillions, on weapons of war. And lies stand tall over the truth, and each day another tale of injustice and murder, and we are looking for someone with an empowering word, and like sheep, we need to be driven. Like sheep, we need boundaries set. We need something to see what we can't envision. Somebody to show us the way, for without it, like sheep, we will sit and sit, and some of us will get lost in the field and become vulnerable to forces that are working to destroy us. For their survival is dependent on them feeding on us. And this good shepherd, after being refueled, seeing the deep need of the people who are out there in great numbers, sees their emotional needs, sees their economic needs, sees their spiritual needs. But they also have an immediate physical need. And Jesus provides out of what seems to be nothing, enough abundance to care for their most immediate needs because you may get some love, a hug, and we need that. And you may get a job, and we need that. You may get prayer, and we need that. But if you are hungry and thirsty and not feeling well, you can't appreciate the love. You can't show up for the job. And you can't be fully open to the Spirit. So Jesus' response is to feed the people, to make a way out of no way. And this feeding of the people reminds us of how Moses, when leading the people, manna was provided. So here in Mark are two contrasting images. In chapter 6, we also have the story of King Herod's feast, it is a story of injustice and murder. It is a story of the 1% celebrating, enjoying their excess and their corruption. And then in the same text, we have the story of another feast. But this time, instead of being a tale of injustice and murder, this feast is about healing, about compassion about the wonder-working power of God through one who walked among us, who felt what we felt, who experienced what we do on this earthly plane, and yet, whose response to this world been on selfish destruction was love, justice, and mercy. Now, I know I'm in Pilgrim, and for those pragmatic thinkers among us, who say, okay, all right. I get the symbolism, but it couldn't have happened. So, for those, let me give you an interpretation of what some scholars think really might have happened. And in 
that retelling became a tale of the inbreaking of the impossible. Some scholars suggest that the real miracle, knowing our inherently selfish nature, knowing our self-preservation instinct, knowing how hard it is to share when you don't have anything, the real miracle was that Jesus convinced a boy to share what he had with people who perhaps he didn't even know. Or if he did know them, had no desire to share anything with them. And the crowd, seeing the generosity of this boy, were so moved that they, they opened their clothes. They reached into their pockets. They opened their baskets. And when each took out a crust of bread, when each took out a piece of fish, a bit of something, it was enough when they put it together and put it into the hands of God to feed a multitude. In fact, it was so much, they had stuff left over. So today, I want you to consider what would happen even in the face of those who sit in high places in towers with their names on them. If the multitudes who are in need of sustenance, if the multitudes needing to be fed, if the multitudes yearning for a good word, would each dare to let each other see how little they really have. Would dare in a consumer culture that drives us to live a life of false appearances, looking like we have more than we have as the measure of our success. When so many of us are in debt trying to keep up that image, if we would dare to open ourselves and let people see how little we really have, and everyone is hungry, and everyone is waiting, what if we dare to say, look, this is, this is all I have, and go against the cultural mindset of, I got mine, I hope you get yours. What if we went against the mindset of success being defined by how much you can consume but rather how much you can give. And we put all of it together. How many lives could we save? With all our combined voices, what policies could we create? With all the clothes in our closets we don't wear, your one dress, your one pair of pants, your one pair of shoes could clothe the naked, by the thousands. With all our combined places of worship, what new vision could we cast and what refuge could we provide? What miracle could happen out of a single piece of bread and a few fish? Out of a single something and a little something on the side? I believe, like this text, a miracle of providing for thousands could occur. I believe the miracle was that there was one who trusted God enough to give what he had so that others could be nourished. And here's the thing. And God did what, what God always does. Took it, pressed down, shook it together, and, and multiplied it. It is a reminder to us to open your baskets, to share what you have. Because it's not just about you. It's about community. And in community, the love of God, the abundance of God is waiting to show up and to show off. So if you are here, 
I want you to know that this community is waiting to receive you. It might not look like much to you, but here in this place, our hearts are open, and if you are willing to open your cloak to reach in your pocket, if you're willing to put even the crumbs in your pocket and put your little something something with our little something something and give it to God and know that God can do something miraculous with it. Meet me and one of the deacons at the table at our parlor after worship. We would love to welcome you and welcome you to be among a community that seeks to feed the multitudes, that seeks to be in community, that believes in the abundance and the inclusion of our Lord.